everyone, Gary Adelman, American Battlefield Trust, and you know I'm psyched. It's Gettysburg 160, Gettysburg Campaign 160, and we are trying, it's taking us years, but we are trying to knock off all the many Gettysburg campaign sites, and we're getting there. You've seen our videos already, perhaps about, uh, you know, uh, uh, Williamsport, Maryland and Falling Waters and Monterey Pass. You've seen us, maybe you've already seen our video about Carlisle, Pennsylvania. We've done Union Mills and the Pipe Creek Line. We've still got some more to go, but I'm really happy to be here at Wrightsville, Pennsylvania, an important and incredible moment in the Gettysburg campaign. But first, before I go any further, please share this with your friends. Uh, subscribe to us on YouTube. The more people that see this, the more people get into and then help preserve American history, which we appreciate. Now. This is June of 1863. Confederate and Union armies are both moving up in this direction. The Confederates have a head start. We've already talked about a lot of this. And the advanced element is under a new corps under uh, Richard Stoddard Ewell. I think you might already know that two of Ewell's three divisions are headed over toward um, Harrisburg uh, so that you could actually cross this impressive river at Harrisburg. So many places you can do that. We'll talk about that a little bit later. But one of his divisions, an experienced one, under Jubal Anderson Early, is coming more eastward. They go through Gettysburg on June 26th, and then they are camped outside there. And then within the next day, they march toward York, Pennsylvania. Okay, uh, it's incredible when I drive to York thinking about doing that march, you know, as an army with everything you need in just a portion of a day. In any case, before they even reached the historic town of York that we'll talk about in a second, um, you've got a civilian coming out and saying, don't mess with our town. And they're like, well, maybe we won't. Uh, and then eventually the town Burgess and some of the uh, muckety mucks come out and they're going to talk to General John B. Gordon. See, it's his brigade. And I think he's already on his big black stallion at that point, uh, you know, sort of a commanding presence. And it is his brigade that's coming through York and is going to come all the way to the area where we are right now. And, you know, Gordon agrees. We, you know, if you're peaceable, if you're not, you know, uh, harassing my troops, we're not going to burn this town. But we might make some requisitions upon you. You may have to give some stuff up. And that's what happened in Gettysburg a couple of days earlier as well, um, when they did not destroy the town, but uh, they had to open the banks and open the stores and the Confederates needed some things. And that's what's gonna happen. And York, happily, will be spared from anything like that. But they have bigger things in mind. It's not York, Pennsylvania. You've got some fertile farmland and a lot of towns around on the other side of the Susquehanna, Lancaster, Lancaster County. Don't say Lancaster. Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. Not to mention a former president living there as well. So in as much as we're around York, Pennsylvania, I want to bring on a good friend of ours. This is David Raymond. He's with Bobblehead George. You'll learn about a little bit more about Bobblehead George later. He's a teacher around here. Thanks so much for coming on, man. Thanks for having us, Gary. Really appreciate it. Good, good. I'm going to step off. Tell us a little bit about York, Pennsylvania. Well, York, Pennsylvania, the county was formed in 1749 out of, out of Lancaster County on the other side of the river. Most importantly, York was where the Articles of Confederation were written in 1777, 1778, after the Battle of Brandywine, the Continental, Ar the Continental Congress fled the city of Philadelphia, came across the river, and they headquartered in York, Pennsylvania. It's there in York where they drafted the Articles of Confederation. Dave, anything you want to say about the Wrightsville Bridge? Are we going to bring on one of the other members of Bobblehead George to do that for us? Well, I'm going to bring on Eric Gimby here in a second. The river itself, the Susquehanna River, is 444 miles long. It's almost a mile wide, and this bridge, I mean, in this river goes all the way down into the Delmarva, into the Chesapeake Bay. It is the largest non-navigable river in the United States of America, even today. So I'm going to bring on my good friend and my colleague, Eric Gimby, and he's going to talk to us about the bridge. So we are standing on the Wrightsville side of the Susquehanna. On the opposite side, we have Columbia. There were multiple bridges that connected Wrightsville and Columbia, but the most famous of these was the second bridge, which stood from 1834 until 1863. The bridge took two years to complete and was financed by the Columbia Bank and Bridge Company for $157,300. At the time of its completion, it was the largest covered bridge in the world, stretching over a mile long at 5,620 feet. Thanks, Eric. Um, so what would this bridge actually look like? So it's completely covered. Um, are we talking railroad bridge, foot traffic, mix of both? It's a mix of both, I believe. Yeah, and it stood on, there's 27 piers that it, uh, it stood on. Um, if you want to continue with the yeah. ultimate fate 
of the bridge. <laughs> so you might be able to, to notice those old piers back there. Those piers um, you'll see in some of our drone footage still uh, exist right beside the modern day road bridge, which will lead you over to Columbia, uh, over into um, Lancaster County. So that'll get you from York County over across the Susquehanna. But in uh, June of 1863, what we have out here are Confederate forces spreading out into South Central Pennsylvania. So to back up just for a moment, we have Richard Yule and his Confederate Second Army Corps who are coming up into South Central Pennsylvania. Now, Lee, Robert E. Lee, the Confederate commander, hasn't changed up much uh, on the campaign. During the Second Manassas campaign, during the Antietam campaign, he let his Second Corps, uh, although at the time not called the Second Corps, under uh, Stonewall Jackson to go off on these independent commands. So in the wake of Jackson's death, we reorganize the Army, and we're going to do the same thing we have done in 1862. We're going to send that core, Jackson's old core, up north, and they are going to come into South Central Pennsylvania. They'll go into towns like York, Gettysburg, Chambersburg. They'll go into the towns. They'll ransom them, essentially, trying to get. Uh, they'll go into the courthouses in, throughout Franklin, Adams, York counties, and they're going to pull out the log books of the uh, tax collector and say, hey, these guys have this many cows or these many horses. And they'll go out to the countryside and try to capture those or maybe pay for them at times with Confederate script, which is basically worthless in the South and the North. But that's what's happening out here at this point. So the Confederates are up here. We have more Confederates moving up from the South. That'll be James Longstreet's Corps as well as uh, AP Hill's Corps. And then the Union Army is kind of chasing along. Now, in the meantime, if we're here in South Central Pennsylvania or Pennsylvania in general, we have a wartime governor who's a Lincoln uh, person. His name is Andrew Curtin. Curtin loves Abraham Lincoln and he thinks that he's going to be able to rally about 50,000 Pennsylvanians to the Union cause because as Lee's men cross the Mason-Dixon line, Lincoln calls for 100,000 troops to come out for this crisis. Basically what we would think of as militia. So we call on West Virginia to give us 25,000 men, Ohio to send 25,000, Pennsylvania hopefully 50. But in the meantime, New York, Massachusetts, and other New England states will start sending troops down into this area. And then into the mix, we will have some old Union Army of the Potomac officers like Darius Couch. He was the second in command of the Army of the Potomac at the Battle of Chancellorsville, the second Corps commander. He doesn't like working for Joe Hooker who's still technically in command of the army up until this day. And then he is going to come into the department of the Susquehanna. He is going to try to organize these forces, which are essentially militia forces to help defend places like Harrisburg, Wrightsville and other spots. Now, Robert E. Lee doesn't exactly want to take the uni or the uh, Pennsylvania capital of Harrisburg. One of the reasons is uh, was pointed out was the fact that the Susquehanna River is so wide. It is going to put a barrier between him and the rest of the Confederacy. If he takes it, it would be great. If he goes off towards Philadelphia and takes Philadelphia, which is probably not in the cards, or off towards Pittsburgh, which are two much more important cities due to industry and other things, those would be great. But in reality, Lee needs to have a retreat line back down into Virginia. He always has to keep his line of retreat open, as well as keep his line of supply and communications open as well. So what Lee is going to do is push off towards the banks of the Susquehanna. He's not going to say, hey, take Harrisburg, but Jubal Anderson early, his bad old man, wants that prize. And he is going to charge, as Gary pointed out, John Brown Gordon to move forward with his brigade, six regiments of Georgians. This is early second uh, battle at the head of this division. This is Gordon's second battle at the head of his Georgia brigade. If you knew uh, John Brown Gordon, most of you probably know him from the battle the bloody lane at antietam on september 17th 1862 he's wounded five times there's a story might be apocryphal might not be where he's wounded falls into his hat his hat's filling with blood and fortuitously a bullet comes in uh hits the hat and pours the blood out so he doesn't drown in his own blood but gordon is back in command here uh, of a brigade coming up towards this area prior to the war he ran some coal mines in georgia um, tennessee and alabama his guys that he put together were known as the raccoon roughs because they come out with raccoon hats and buckskin pants. And the governor of Georgia is like, yeah, we don't need these guys. And they have to go to Alabama to join up with the Confederacy. But Gordon has been in this war since 1861. He's a seasoned officer, even though he has no military training. He is going to be tasked with coming out here towards Wrightsville, which is directly behind Gary in the camera. 
and then come out here to hopefully seize the bridge, which spanned the Susquehanna for more than 5,000 feet across the Susquehanna itself, 40 feet wide, and then we can turn north towards Harrisburg. That's the idea. In the meantime, his brigade of about 2,200 men will start moving into this direction. Wow. We have Pennsylvania Emergency Militia moving into this area. Specifically, it's the 27th Pennsylvania Emergency Militia. That's under the command of a guy named Jacob Frick. Frick is a uh, Army of the Potomac veteran. He served as the colonel of a nine-month regiment, the 129th Pennsylvania. He assaulted Marie's Heights. He fought at 1st Fredericksburg and at 2nd Fredericksburg, uh, I'm sorry, and at Chancellorsville. And he will be a Medal of Honor recipient in 1896, I believe. He'll receive the Medal of Honor for actions there. But Frick's a combat officer. He also has some men with some combat experience under him, even though these emergency militia are largely militiamen just being pulled from the countryside. We have men from the 87th Pennsylvania who have fallen back from the Second Battle of Winchester. You Gettysburg aficionados might know a guy named Wesley Culp. Uh, who was uh, meeting up with a guy named Jack Skelly, who had fought with the 87th and was mortally wounded there. And then, of course, we have the story of Jenny Wade. Then we'll have some men from the 20th uh, Pennsylvania Emergency Militia and the 26th Pennsylvania Emergency Militia, units that have been run off. And then we'll also bring in from York, there's a military hospital here. We'll bring in men from the military hospital who will help to fight the walking wounded, if you will. These are veteran soldiers. And then we'll have a uh, group of approximately 20 citizens who will come out from this area. They're African-Americans who are free African-Americans who come out to help build defensive works and stand and fight with this mixed force here. And in fact, Darius Couch, the Union commander overall in this area, will say that they fought better than the white troops beside them and did much more work whenever he writes his official report. He was very impressed by them. And in fact, the only casualty on the Union side here who was killed outright was one of those uh, free blacks who were fighting here at the battle at Wrightsville. So up on top of the heights, which were off to um, uh, behind the camera here, off into the area of Wrightsville, we'll start setting up defensive works. We'll have approximately 1,500 Federals, Union soldiers who are up on high ground, and then we'll have Gordon's Brigade moving into this area. Now, the idea is that we're gonna have this bridge behind us. What do we do with it? Uh, if, we can't, if we can't hold back the Confederates, which Jubal Early's not taking these Confederates very seriously, uh, he thinks he can brush them aside, we think we're going to destroy part of the bridge. That's key. We're not going to try to destroy more than 5,000 feet of this bridge because it's important. This was the main line to get you across the Susquehanna. This is the main road that led you across the state from Pennsylvania, uh, Philadelphia over to Pittsburgh. You don't want to destroy this infrastructure if you can help it. But Colonel Frick is going to try to destroy a section or two of this bridge, drop it in the river so later on the uh, federal forces could come back and rebuild it if the Confederates take it. Well, Gordon, according to a, probably an apocryphal story, is handed a, a bouquet of roses from a young lady, and there's a note inside of it that have all of the defenses of Wrightsville in it, all laid out. This is po probably apocryphal because Gordon takes most of the day to get here to Wrightsville. If he had that order, he's moving like McClellan. We had Order 191 during the Antietam campaign. He's moving at fairly glacial pace up here deploys his men, and then we start to have a skirmish around 4.30 in the afternoon, June 28, 1863. And Frick's men will put up probably the stoutest resistance of any of these Pennsylvania militia who fought in South Central PA. Then as the uh, sunlight starts to fade and these Federals start being pushed back, they're going to start falling back to the bridge. The order is given to try to destroy a few spans of that bridge. The men will start to move back across the bridge itself, some of them in good order, like the 87th Pennsylvania, Company E or F of the 27th Pennsylvania, or emergency militia, they, they were said to be marching off in good order. Um, they're not running away like some of these men had done earlier in the campaign, and they start to try to drop this bridge into the water. They will drill holes under the superstructure, they'll put gunpowder inside of it, try to blow it up, they'll blow part of the roof off, blows part of the siding off, but it doesn't destroy the superstructure because it's so well built. So now what do we do? We go to the other side of the Susquehanna, about a mile and a quarter um, across the Susquehanna from us. They get coal oil and they start to put that onto the bridge and they start to light the bridge. And as they pull back across the bridge, the entire bridge starts to burn. And Gordon's brigade comes out. 
and they start to say, hey, 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 we need this bridge. People of Wrightsville, will you give us your buckets? Do you have a fire engine? Do you have anything that we have here? And they basically said, nah, you guys can go uh, pound sand. And the Confederates are a little upset about this. Then the wind shifts. And over into this area where lumber mills and other uh, outbuildings here on the edge of town, they start to catch on fire and that starts to spread. And now they turn to the Confederates, these people of Wrightsville, and say, hey, can you help us? And magically, buckets show up and anything else that they need. And they go down to the riverfront and down to the canal that was down around here, and they form a bucket brigade and start throwing water up onto the houses, the structures out here. They even knock down a few buildings using gunpowder to level them to create a fire break, and they save the town of Wrightsville, which is ironic because some of the men in Gordon's Georgia Brigade had already lost their homes to Union soldiers who had destroyed part of, parts of uh, northern Georgia, northeast Georgia, uh, earlier in the war. So these guys are up here trying to help save a Union uh, town, a northern town, and some of them grumble about it in their diaries afterwards. So the town itself is saved. In fact, Gordon is, uh, and his staff are invited by the mayor's daughter the next day to come to their house and have breakfast. They give breakfast to these soldiers. And what always stands out to me is the, the people of South Central Pennsylvania they thought would come out for the Confederate cause because this is very democratic territory. This was not Lincoln territory in 1864. In fact, this whole area will go to George McClellan in the 1864 presidential um, election. What also stands out to me are the letters writing home, how some of these men were talking about the barns in this area, about how impressive they were with these German farmers out here. And they said that their houses were pretty poor looking, but their barns were basically palaces. They also mentioned to their ladies at home how the ladies up here in Pennsylvania weren't as attractive uh, as the ladies in the South. And I always wonder, like, was that the case or were you just trying to tell your wives and sweethearts that, hey, don't worry, we're on campaign and they're not as pretty as you. So take that for what you would think. But they talk about some of the ladies being harsher because they're out here working. They're also talking about their mouths on them. And I'm from Pennsylvania. I know they've got some, some mouths on them because I do. And um, the other thing that always stuck out to the Confederates here was the fact that there were so many men not in the army, farming, working, doing whatever. That always stuck out to these Confederates. The, uh, the, this uh, manpower, this dearth of manpower in the South and the glut of manpower up here in the North. But this is important. The people around here think that the burning of the bridge um, is going to stop the Confederates from pushing farther into South Central Pennsylvania. It did. How deep could they have gone because Lee's about to pull the army back together, we'll never know. But poor Jacob Frick, who does his duty out here, gets uh, um, lambasted for burning that bridge and destroying that bridge. Because they said, oh, you should only have burned part of it. He doesn't know that at the time. Lee's army's coming this way. His orders are to try to defend Harrisburg. He did it the best he could with the with the uh, tools he had at, at, the, at his disposal. And in the end, Wrightsville is a fantastic story. And the bridge fire was seen allegedly up and down the Susquehanna River. And it was seen as far south as Maryland. It was seen into Adams County, deep into Lancaster County. And this would have been a sight to see here during the Gettysburg campaign. And so that's the story of the Wrightsville Bridge. It's a really cool story. If you ever get a chance to come up from Gettysburg, go to places like Carlisle, York, out here to Wrightsville. Check out Harrisburg, um, and they have the Pennsylvania State Archives up there if you're a researcher wanting to learn more about the campaign. So let me turn it back over to Gary. We're going to do our round robin of switching the cameras out here. Thanks, Chris. I just wanted to add a couple of things. First of all, you're with the American Battlefield Trust. We're here with our guests from Bobblehead, Georgia. We're at the John Wright Restaurant. We really thank uh, everybody here, our good friends here, good food and everything like that for giving us this great place to shoot. And uh, you could be eating and drinking around here someday if you would like. I got to take issue with a little bit of what some of the people in the war said because, you know, we're along the Susquehanna River. I was married along the Susquehanna River up near Williamsport, and I married a Pennsylvania girl, so I'm going to go ahead and disagree with what some of those soldiers uh, said as well. I'd also like to, you know, just while you were talking, Chris, you could kind of look around here and I could imagine the burning of the bridge, of the embers flying around, of the floating rafts that were made of burning uh, timbers as they floated down the Susquehanna River. And I mean, this place, you know, had seen so much history as David talked about already, you know, and this, you know, area, it seems pretty remote, you know, maybe at the time, but come here, there's a lot 
that this place has to offer at the time. York was the largest city between Baltimore and Harrisburg. It was right on that line between Philadelphia and Pittsburgh. So, you know, this sat at an important crossroads and whatnot. Um, one thing I want to talk about real quick is to make sure you all learn what in the world is Bobblehead George. So come back on uh, one or both of you and uh, tell me what is Bobblehead George? I can already say I'm a fan. Well, Bobblehead George is a nonprofit organization and we're dedicated to providing entertaining, unique and educational content to lifelong learners of all ages. Uh, we started this during the pandemic. It's really taken off and it is just an absolute dream to be able to do this. Yeah, make sure um, we're on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, pretty much everywhere where you can find social media content. Good. Yeah, well and, spoken. Yeah, and you can also visit us at our website at bobbleheadgeorge.org. It's like one-stop shop for all of our videos and all of our content. Uh, hang in here for a second, guys, because you know one of our most popular videos, certainly in our top 15, is when we you know, got together and fought out the Battle of Brandywine in miniature with our friends at Little Wars TV, and we actually did it on the Brandywine battlefield. Now, when I watch Bobblehead George stuff, I know you do a lot of different things, and it's three teachers, the videos are great. You seem to have an, an interest not just in George Washington, but in presidents in general, and we're near a president's house right now. In fact, the Confederates wanted to go across this bridge in part so that they could shake the hand hand of um, former President James Buchanan. What shake the hand of might have meant, though, was to kidnap the guy, but James Buchanan refused to leave his house, Wheatland, something you can still visit to this day. Have you guys ever done an episode there? Yeah, we did. We filmed at Wheatland in 2021. We did a uh, tour of the house. Uh, Wheatland, if you've never been there, is a spectacular place to go visit. Uh, James Buchanan is sometimes often considered to be the, one of the worst presidents, but his house is amazing, and you need to go check it out. And I think you can do that uh, by visiting Lancaster History. Um, I really agree. I, I had a great experience at Wheatland about 10 or 12 years ago, and the story was much more interesting than I expected. Um, so watch their video on Bobblehead George. Uh, that's their YouTube channel. And uh, go up to Wheatland if you can. Guys, anything else to add? Yeah, you know, here in Wrightsville, it's not just the bridge. If, you could, if you're in, familiar with the area, you can go up the hill to Mount Pisgah Cemetery, where a lot of the Civil War Confederate, I mean, sorry, Civil War soldiers, the, the black soldiers that fought here at Wrightsville are buried right here in the local town. Or just up the river, about a mile and a half, there are unmarked graves of Confederate soldiers who were killed during the skirmishes here. So there's so much to see, to hear, see, see here in Wrightsville, Pennsylvania. Anything to add, Eric? I uh, just thank you very much for coming out to okay. Wrightsville. Good, good. And it's easy to find because it's right along the Civil War Trail, Civil War Trails, uh, the world's largest open air museum. Thanks to Chris White. Thanks to the John Wright Restaurant. Thanks to you guys at Bobblehead George. Thank you all for watching and for supporting battlefield preservation and education. Thank you, Gary. And thank you.